Academia is a real space in which we train real people to learn advanced things about potentially every subject of human endeavor. So when you say we've had enough of experts, have we had enough of that? Have we had enough of study? Have we had enough of learning? Have we had enough of thinking? Part of the assumption embedded in all of these debates is the idea, as I said at the beginning, that the so-called experts keep getting it wrong. Expert economists did not get the crash and recession right, and therefore the logic goes, we should ignore them. They're merely dealing with arid theories and we need people with real world experience. And this is all based on a presumed opposition between expertise on the one hand and experience on the other. Expertise, the assumption goes, is academic, theoretical, untested, and therefore often, in truth, turns out to be mistaken because it was just a set of ideas that got cooked up in a laboratory, as it were. Whereas instead of the theoretical, the argument goes, we'd be better off with the practical, the experienced. And this all sounds very sensible up to a point, but it's based on a series of fallacies. The first is the assumption that academia is what we now like to call a bubble, a protected space in which ideas can be wafted about without benefit of being tested in real conditions. If there were such people whose ideas were purely academic in that respect, theoretical in that respect, then we might well expect them to get things wrong. And there are academics probably who push so far in that direction that you might think, yeah, that's actually not going to turn out to be true. The assumption that academics have no real world experience is so widespread, as I say, as to be a truism, but it's also based on an assumption about what makes somebody an academic and what kind of background they have. The fact is, is nobody knows what experience a given expert has. Academics come from all walks of life. They, go to, they come from the army, they come from the business world. They, they retrain, many of us work with industry government um, as collaborators and partners. And as I said, moreover, universities are not imaginary places. So we all are embedded in all of these real world experiences and academics also have extra academic qualifications. The idea that that makes us less qualified to have an opinion seems to me to be perverse. What they're really getting at in this idea of the real world experience is the idea of privileging people who have been in commercial environments, particularly business environments, over other kinds of environments. And I just don't accept that commercial environments are more real than other kinds of environments. They are real, yes but so are other environments. It's the same kind of special pleading that supporters of Trump and Sarah Palin like to make, that they inhabit the real world and the rest of us inhabit somewhere else. They inhabit the real America, I inhabit a bubble. Well, I have said before, and I'll say again, I think the people uh, living in totally homogeneous environments with 100 people who all love Trump are the ones in a bubble. I live in a city with 8 million people from all over the world, that is not a bubble. But there's another kind of bubble as well that is being promulgated in these kinds of debates and in our current political discourse. And that bubble is, is insulation from knowledge. A fact-free environment is a bubble. Now that is a safe space. No bad ideas can ever enter it or challenge your assumptions and biases. None of us can ever entirely overcome our own biases, but we can try. The assumption about academic expertise is tied up in a similar set of assumptions about what the real world is and what real ideas are and the, uh, the other kinds of ideas that are useless. That it's somehow grittier and realer to be trading money instead of ideas, for example. As if anyone in this world doesn't deal with money. As if anyone in this world doesn't deal with ideas. We all work in a world of money and a world of ideas we don't all spend the same balance on both, that is true. Some spend more time, for instance, thinking about money. Some spend more, for instance, thinking about ideas. But everybody has some. Some people fix things with their hands. That is a great and valuable thing, and we need lots of people who can fix things with their hands. Is that more real than fixing things with an idea? It's a false binary. They're both good things. We don't need to create an either or, we need both. We need people who can fix things with their hands and like doing that and are good at it, and we need people who can fix things with their ideas and are good at that and like doing it. Laws are ideas that fix real world problems. You can't make a table without an idea of what a table is, how it is put together, how it should be put together. Architects have to think a lot about theory in order to understand not just engineering and how a building is built, but they have to think about the humans who will inhabit it, they have to think about social spaces, they have to think, they have to think about lots of different aspects of the problem of, of what it is that a house is meant to do. 
We all deal in a balance between the real and the imagined, what is and what ought to be, the imperative and the conditional. What do we do? What can we do? What should we do? This is, these are the questions that all of us are involved in every day of our lives. So what is the feeling that people in this country have had enough of experts about? It packs in all kinds of assumptions about authority, about power, about access to political and economic control, about rationality and emotion. It is partly a resistance to technocracy, um, to the consolidation of technocratic power that is conflated with this old stereotype about academics who lack real world experience. It's also, I think, based on the fact that experts, especially academic experts, too often rely on a language of expertise, a technical specialized language that is designed to be efficient so that experts can talk to other experts without always going back to basics and starting at the beginning. But it is, and that is a useful thing, but it is also designed to be exclusionary to create barriers to entry, and it works. A lot of people feel excluded from the language that academics talk, and they feel excluded for a reason, because that language is designed to make you feel that you do not understand the concepts that are being shared. Or it's not designed only in order to do that, but it is one of its consequences and one of its effects. And that does need reformation. That I feel very passionately, academics must reform our own language so that the ideas that we're talking about in quote unquote experts terms can get shared as widely as possible. The crux of the matter, however, comes to me, and I always go back to the meanings of words and to etymologies because I'm a word geek, and what it comes down to is that the word expertise actually comes from the Latin for experience. They mean the same thing. All expertise is practical by definition. Expertise means what you have experience in. So the idea that there are experts and then there are people without, with experience is a false binary we've created, and we've created it quite recently. It is partly, I think, a way of gaslighting intellectual expertise in the ways that John was suggesting at the beginning. It's a way of suggesting that we can do without intellectuals, we can do without knowledge. Um, and I'm going to talk at the, at the end of my remarks about what we're left with if we try to do that. The divide itself between expertise and experience is a spurious divide. And both sides of this debate need to recognize the legitimacy of the expertise of the other, instead of thinking that only their kind of expertise matters. Certainly there are academics, um, and I've met them, and I'm sure John has too, who don't think that practical experience is equal to their theoretical understanding and vice versa. And I think that that binary, that oppositional logic, that con we keep getting into these divisive ideas about us and them and who's better. We need both, we need it all. We need people with practical experience. We need people who, uh, who think about ideas and who, and who understand how those things come together. People who have so-called practical skills just have a different set of expertises. And people who have academic expertise have a different set of expertises. And we need all of those. So what I want to reform is not expertise per se, but how we think and talk about expertise and experience to realize that they are synonymous. As for the experts who failed to predict the crash or failed to deal properly with the consequences of the crash, who failed to predict Brexit or Trump or are failing to deal properly with the consequences of those elections, those are failures of leadership. They are not necessarily failures of experts, but we could also put it another way and say that they are failures caused by insufficient expertise. Our experts are not expert enough. We have inexpert experts. We need more expertise, not less. So my reform would be that we should embrace expertise and experience together and see them as the collaborative partners that they are. We need as much expertise to be brought on any problem as possible. And we have to stop making false binaries because they are totally destroying our ability to think about our own world. At the moment, our distrust of experts opens up the space for so-called surrogates. So instead of experts, we now have surrogates. The stand-ins 
questions for any given politician who are usually paid flunkies who go on television and simply parrot whatever ideas that politician wants them to parrot. These are politicians who are being given permission by the populace to avoid the experts who would disagree with them or challenge their ideas, help hold them to account, and bring in hired guns instead, these surrogates who become their mouthpieces. We have pushed expertise out of the public sphere just when we need it most, not because expertise will solve all of the problems or because it has all of the answers, but because it might be able to solve some of the problems or have some of the answers or at least ask tougher questions. Real expertise just means people who have thought about these problems more than other people. We need people who are experienced at thinking about those problems. That doesn't mean they'll always be right. And what we're doing right now is saying that because some experts failed, we can dispense with the idea of experts all together. We need to stop demanding perfection from people. We distrust experts because experts make mistakes. Well, they're human. Experts doesn't mean they are perfected, you know, uh, platonic, you know, ideals of the intellectual. It's a big, complicated world. They will not always get it right, to say the least. But they have thought about and studied and worked with the problems, and they have experience in thinking about those problems. They have experience in trying to solve those problems. That doesn't mean it all, they're always right. It doesn't mean we just submit automatically without arguing with them or challenging them or encouraging them to rethink their own assumptions. But at the moment, we're automatically discounting them because they're experts. And that just seems to me absurd. Part of what Gove was mobilizing was widespread anti-intellectualism, the conflation of liberal elites and university educated people and ivory towers and people in bubbles and all of these with experts to imply that all of these people inhabit some kind of lesser space and that everybody else inhabits some kind of superior space. It's a deeply divisive logic. It's a divide and conquer kind of a conversation that's coming from our so-called leaders. I'm okay, I'm, I'm gonna object to so-called experts. I'm not gonna object to so-called leaders. Um, and my further point is that everyone has experience. Everyone has experience. And the deeper your experience of a given subject or area, the greater your expertise. It's that simple. To be an expert on Jane Austen, do you have to have a university degree in Jane Austen? Of course not. Sorry, but of course not. Um, you have to have read a hell of a lot about Jane Austen. You have to have read all of Jane Austen, thought about Jane Austen. You have to read a lot about Jane Austen. You have to think a lot about Jane Austen. And then you know a lot about Jane Austen. It's just that universities are spaces in which you can do that and in which people are encouraged to do that. Um, and there are reasons why we do that, which John and I can talk about if you want. He knows a lot about the value of, of teaching and thinking about Jane Austen. They're trying to create a category difference out of something that is a difference in degree, not kind. They're trying to say that expertise and experience are two different categories, and they're just simply a spectrum. The more you know about any given subject, the more expertise in it you have. I want to finish by talking about some surrogates who've made the news lately, because they have a few things in common that seem to me quite salient. One is that they are all surrogates for or supporters of Donald Trump. That's one thing they have in common. But they have other things in common. Melania Trump was, she is his wife, but she also acted as one of his surrogates at the Republican National Convention. She gave a speech in which it was widely recognized that she had plagiarized Michelle Obama, and that got a lot of coverage. After Trump's inauguration, one of the first senior advisors he tried to appoint was a woman called Monica Crowley, and he wanted her to be senior director of strategic communications for the National Security Council, but she was forced out or she backed out um, when it was discovered by CNN that her book had more than 50 examples of plagiarism in it, including passages from Wikipedia, <laughs> news columns, articles, and that she had just bunged those all in. And, she had, and, that, and then they found after they looked at that book, they went back and looked at her PhD dissertation from Columbia, which really should have known better, and that she had plagiarized more than a dozen passages in her PhD dissertation. At first, Trump tried to defend her, and then eventually she got backed out, uh, forced out without the conversation about plagiarism ever happening. Now there is a man called Sheriff Clark who's in the news right now who you might have seen tell of. He's a terrible man from Wisconsin. Um, he's a terrible man. He has, he has 
he's, a, he's, a, he's in charge of a prison system where his prisoners die regularly from dehydration. The man, is a, he's a bad man. He decorates himself with fake military medals. He has no military experience, but he always stands up with all of these military medals, like Gaddafi or somebody. And he claims to have a PhD. And guess what? It's fake. Uh, sorry, it's plagiarized, rather. Um, and then there's somebody called Mr. Gorka. Uh, or he likes to call himself Dr. Gorka. Um, he, again, is a Trump surrogate. He's been on CNN a lot. He presents himself as a scholar of terrorism, and then he comes on and supports the Muslim ban, and he makes deeply inaccurate statements about the history of the Middle East and about what um, Islam believes and all of, or, you know, teaches and all of these um, uh, kinds of things that he's supposedly an expert on. And what happened was a real academic named Andrew Reynolds at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, did a bit of investigating. Gorka put his thesis online and this is Reynolds, Professor Reynolds' words. He wrote, Gorka is a fraud, a charlatan of the most brazen hue, a snake oil sa salesman whose supposed PhD dissertation would have never passed muster in America or Britain, and to put the cherry on the cake was approved by a fraudulent panel of examiners. It turned out that his examiners were two people with a BA, um, and as Professor Reynolds points out, undergraduates don't award PhDs. Um, uh, two people with a BA and an old family friend who happens also to be a fascist. Um, and those, I mean, like a card-carrying published fascist. And those are the people who examined his PhD, and now he goes around on TV saying that he's Dr. Gorka, the well-known Islam expert. It is no coincidence, in other words, that Trump surrounds himself with fake experts. And my question is this, if expertise doesn't matter, why are these people so busy faking it? It's not the experts that put us into a post-truth era. It's the frauds, the liars, and the fakes. This relates to the populist faith in the gifted amateur, the faith that got Trump elected. We're suspicious of the establishment and certain that an outsider can shake things up, can reform things, can revolutionize them. Well, reformation is a fine thing up to a point, but Donald Trump's revolution is one I can live without. Part of the expertise it is rebelling against is the cool elitist rationalism of Obama. We have a pendulum swing from that to emotion, to making inexpert choices, to support frauds who pretend to be experts. Expertise, and also uh, somebody pointed out to me as well that um, Putin's circle is also surrounded by people who, who have uh, PhDs that they purchase. They're all plagiarized and they're ghostwritten. They purchase them from dissertation mills. And, and it's, so it's a very Russian thing as well to pay for these, these fake credentials so that you can style yourself um, as a PhD. Expertise has a purpose. Expertise is not our enemy. Do we need fresh ideas? Yes, we do. Do we need to break out of some of the patterns and assumptions that expertise can train you into? Certainly, we do. We need to consistently encourage each other to think outside of the box. But post-expertise embraces post-truth. Saying we don't need expertise is like saying we don't need knowledge or wisdom, that we can dispense with it because we've moved beyond it. Expertise is a quality, it's an aspiration. It's not a credential, it's not a bureaucratic process. Expertise is people at their absolute best across all walks of life. I do prefer airline pilots and brain surgeons and yes, lawyers who have expertise. I don't want an inexpert lawyer defending me in a trial. I don't want an inexpert doctor treating me for cancer. I certainly don't want an inexpert plumber fixing my sewage pipes. Why would we want inexpert thinkers? Thinking is a skill, so is leading. These are both skills that can be taught and it can be, they can be learned and they can be improved. I would say that the real problem is with the narrowing of expertise. It's with over-specialization. It's with the idea that economics, for example, could be predicted without factoring in how people behave so that Greenspan and his cohort could convince themselves that something called a rational actor would define the marketplace when neither people nor markets act rationally in fact, nor did it allow for competing interests or competing ideas of what a rational response to a given situation might be. It assumed there was only one rational response and everybody would agree on it and everybody would make that choice and that is precisely not what happened. But that isn't a problem with expertise. That is a problem with insufficient expertise. We all need to be better at what we do. If your experts make mistakes, don't conclude that means you don't need expertise. Conclude you need better experts. 
I was speaking to a friend this morning about this talk, and he asked me what my thesis would be, and I sketched it out, and he asked me if I'd heard Simon Shama last night. I wasn't able to, which I was very sad about, but I imagine some of you did. And he outlined Shama's argument for me about the fact that we are living through an assault on knowledge, which is the foundation of all of our democratic systems. I couldn't agree more, and I was delighted to hear that Simon had exemplified my thesis for me. I have just presented you with a talk from a lesser expert. I understand his talk has been recorded, and if you didn't see it, or if you did, go watch it and see what a better expert looks like, and you will agree with me that what we need always are better experts. Thank you.